Hi, I've been having a lot of really interesting conversations recently about how to use a wand therapeutically, which is um, the plastic, curved plastic device that phys physiotherapists use in the pelvic floor to help people to be able to release their own muscles. So this one's um, mostly for the physios, but if you're a patient watching this, then I hope you'll get a lot out of it as well. What I've mostly been wanting to say to people who have found my website or found my YouTube site is it's not all about the wand. The wand's a really useful device but it's not for everyone and it's not for um, it's not useful with everyone and it's not something we use with every patient nor is it a, a magic wand for healing. It is just a really useful device to allow you to do your own physio at home. Um, most of the time with my patients I actually get people if they're comfortable to use their own thumbs so they might put their leg up and use their own thumb to do some pelvic floor release um, in a direction and an area that we will have um, decided together having had a full workup and a full screen first. It's really important that before you're considering doing any of this pelvic floor work that you see a specialist. Um, it doesn't have to be a physio, just a medical professional that knows about pain in this area. So I get a lot of patients to um, use their own thumbs which is really easy. Um, you can access each side so opposite thumb to opposite side and that's very effective and it's often really quick. You've always got your thumbs with you, hopefully, so you can do it when you're on holiday. Um, and most of the time that tends to be really acceptable. With some people that don't want to be able to do self-touch, don't want to use it inside, then using a wand can be helpful because it gives them that little bit of distance so uh, they don't have to touch themselves. And with those people that don't want to do any self-touch, which is a lot of people, the wand is not for everyone, then we use uh, squat positions and deep breathing exercises, which gets the pelvic floor to de descend to some degree. Um, but it's certainly a way that they can uh, achieve some lengthening of their pelvic floor without having to um, have an internal device or do any internal release themselves. Hopefully they'll get some carryover and actually with a lot of people, especially with gentlemen that maybe don't want to be um, internally assessed so often or at all, we use down training with pelvic floor squats, so a happy baby position in yoga or a deep squat position if your knees are comfortable with abdominal breathing as a way of really down training the pelvic floor. It's not a one stop shop, it's not one size fits all, um, it's just one thing that we use. So. I want to take it back a step because I had some really, really good chats with people asking me about how to find trigger points in the pelvic floor, where they are, which ones they need to get rid of, and how to go about that, what kind of pressures with the pelvic floor with wand or, or with your finger. Now, I want to take that step back and say it's not about trigger points. So we've moved on now in the literature. We know that there's been huge amounts of exploration done into what trigger points are, where they exist, whether we can find them. They've done MRIs, they've done ultrasounds, they've done all sorts of things. And the general consensus is that trigger points don't exist. Now, I'm not taking away at all from your experience or my experience of finding nodules, them being painful to someone and that creating pain somewhere else. I'm more asking you to think a little bit more about why that might occur. We know that that phenomenon is, I can't say that word, phenomenon, is um, something that we see all the time and certainly making those areas hurt less by whatever we do makes a big change to people's lives. But what is actually there? Now, um, if you're on Twitter at all, following John Quinter is a great idea. Quintner, Quintner is a great idea. Um, reading any of his, his, his books or his articles is also great. There's a great 2014 quote that I will put in the blog down here somewhere, um, which he very much more eloquently states um, what I'm trying to say, is that we really don't have any good evidence of what it is. Now, again, people that are fighting back about evidence versus experience, don't worry, I'm not saying that there's there's nothing going on or nothing there, it just means that we don't know what it is yet, and it's probably not a hyper-irritable bundle of muscular um, striated fibres that are overactive with a neural end plate, which is what it used to be. We now go towards a bit more what we call tension myalgia, where we've got these painful points within a muscle or areas of pain which are modulated by our, our nervous system, so our brain's understanding of what threat is understanding or a decision that that area is under threat and therefore creating a painful stimulus, so an output from the brain, creating a painful response that or an experience that then um, means that you have to take care of that area or you need to pay attention to it because you're potentially under threat. 
which is a much more interesting and nuanced idea about what is going on in the middle. And that's what I want to take you, want you to take away with at the moment. That's where we're at. I'll update this obviously as more research comes through, but that's kind of where we are. So it doesn't mean what you're doing isn't working, it just means you're not doing what you think you're doing, which is mostly what I wanted to say in this vlog today. So what do we know? What do we know is actually going on in the pelvic floor of people with chronic pelvic pain? So we know we get massive sensation changes. The threshold for the nerves to fire, if, if this is this is a normal threshold, so however you get much more stimulus, you get to here and then the nerve will fire. The threshold in people with um, pelvic pain in their, in their distal nerves um, gets much smaller, so it only takes a smaller amount of stimulus before that firing of, of, of a nerve ending, we get information into the brain about that area, which means that the brain gets bombarded with a lot more information from downstairs than it normally would. So there's some fantastic work by Dr. Melissa Farmer looking, and some others, a couple of years, looking at um, sensation in rats and mice, I think it was rats, and humans with vulvodynia. And what they looked at was that women, human, human women, with um, out any problems, when they were touched in a certain way with a certain device, it's very, very incredibly gentle, they couldn't feel anything. But those with vulvodynia, any pain downstairs, could. So their sensation and their perception of touch at a very, very gentle um, level was much heightened. And they felt that as touch. Now, when you then press them in a way or touch them in a way that in normal healthy controls was um, a comfortable level of touch, the women with vulvodynia had a much heightened response to that and reported pain. So we can see that there is a really big hypersensitivity, that the nerves are firing or the brain is deciding that a greater degree of threat is going on to a stimulus than they previously should have had. So that's one, sensation changes. We know that we also get some degree, or it's postulated, but we get some degree of nervous edema, which means that the distal nerves, um, there is some irritation from fluids surrounding them, and that's because the pelvic floor is in a constant state of contraction, or at least a heightened state of contraction compared to where it normally would be, which allows for less neural, uh, allows for less kind of, um, oh, what's it called? You know what I mean. When you get a uh, backflow of normal edema into the system. There's a word for it, I've forgotten it right now. Um, so you get that pooling of the edema around the nervous structures which can then again work to increase, uh, to reduce the threshold at which they fire, cause a gentle constant irritation. Um, and building on that, the really interesting stuff that I've been talking about recently is that autonomic dysfunction. So um, in myofascial pelvic pain, Mr. Chalimsky and his team um, in America somewhere um, talked about there being a uh, an autonomic dysfunction causing kind of almost like a neuropathy um, within the pelvic floor muscles of people with myofascial pelvic pain. Um, and there also being, particularly in bladder pain syndrome, a vascular neuropathy, which is due to vagal nerve um, dysregulation. So what you end up getting is poorer blood supply to, supply to the pelvic floor muscles, which means they're more, again, they're under a bit more of attack, the brain registers less oxygen, and that could potentially be a mechanism by which the brain then decides it needs to put the pelvic floor in a bit more tension. So we've got that tension going on. We've got this autonomic neuropathy, we've got a vascular neuropathy, we get a vascular hypersensitivity or, or heightened sensation um, or changes. So the vascular system is likely to rapidly change more than it would do um, in areas. You also get vast brain changes in people with chronic pelvic pain. So their motor, motor areas and their sensory areas are vastly changed. And uh, in, in such a way that the fMRI studies are completely uh, Conclusive is a bad word. I, I didn't do the research, so I can't say that. But nonetheless, they have a commonality which shows that we get specific changes in specific conditions that are all very similar. And that means that the brain doesn't really know what's going on motor-wise, mechanoreceptor-wise, and it doesn't really know what's going on from a sensory point of view. You're going to get a lot more visceral overlap. So we've got that going on. We've also got some huge changes in the salience network, which is how much attention the brain pays to the pelvic region and specific areas of, of it. Um, so your salience network should be the guy going, whoa, pay attention to that, whoa, you need to pay attention to that threat, and or don't worry about so much attention to that. And in um, chronic pelvic pain, you get an increase in uh, salience network activity in association with sensational motor input to the pelvic floor region so it's pay your brain just can't switch off from that pelvis which we know every patient comes through the door and just says it's on my mind all day I can't get away from it it's constant 
Yeah, because your brain's going, I'm under threat. I need to know about this. Which bear is eating me? Where is it biting me? Uh, unfortunately, but we can change that. And then finally, if we, uh, Melissa Farmer did some work into chronicity of pain and what areas um, uh, take over and the areas that start or the initial insult to the, to the, um, to the area is not necessarily how it's maintained and managed in the long term, how the brain deals with that initial insult. It's very different to its maintenance. And what she observed was that pelvic pain over the long run in, I think it was a rat model, um, became managed by the limbic system, which means that your emotional centre is managing your pain. And that's because for a long time that brain is full of, I'm under pain, and pain, pain, threat, pain, 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 and it gets tiring. And the brain needs to have other options. It needs to be open to be able to say, I need to know what's going on in case there's more pain in my foot or if something bites my leg or if there's another bear coming to threaten me or some other kind of threat in my body. And so it shifts the management of your pelvic, chronic pelvic pain to your limbic system. And so now your emotions are involved and that's what we see a lot of the time. In fact, every single patient that comes through the door um, with me, certainly there is a huge degree of emotional overlap. And none of this is the patient's fault. I say this to my juniors sometimes, and I, I've said this to many people before, none of this is the patient's fault. This is what happens in the brain, and it's not something that they can necessarily, um, uh, they're not necessarily responsible for. Now there are, there are um, ways that we can work with catastrophizing behavior and, and kind of coping strategies, but at the end of the day, um, these changes are not something that they've created. Um, it's a result of the situation and the socioeconomic situation they're in and behavioural principles that they've grown up with and their brain. So uh, we need to work with that, not against it. Okay, so that brings me to the bit where I tell you that you are a pelvic floor ninja badass. Because if you're doing pelvic floor down training work in pelvic pain, I think you're awesome. I think you're absolutely brilliant. Um, and nothing that I've said today ha means that you're any less of a badass. Well done! The, the, this condition and this group of conditions and these patients can be really, really challenging to work with. And I salute anyone that's, that's kind of out there doing it because it's such a rewarding area and it really can change lives. So well done. But let's talk about what you're doing. So when you put your finger onto a pelvic floor and you feel its range of motion or you feel that it's painful and you think, oh, that's a bit close, it's really, really overactive. And then you have a go at trying to get it to relax down. What are you actually doing? You're not stretching it. You're not getting rid of trigger points. Um, you are giving it a massage of sorts, but let's go through our evidence and have a look at what you're actually doing. So the first thing you're doing is creating a brilliant therapeutic relationship with your patients. And I really hope you are. Um, but certainly any of us doing any um, internal palpation, we've got to that point before we've uh, tried to do an internal examination. The minute that you create a therapeutic relationship or an alliance with your patient, you are reducing their level of threat. They have got someone to rely on, they have got someone helping them, um, you are cognitively overriding some of their pain centres, which is real and really important, to help them to um, reduce the level of threat down there. The more that you educate them, the more you increase their locus of control, locus of control, um, uh, the, the ability they have to manage their own symptoms is massively important in how much they're able to cope and actually how much pain they're in. We have so many studies showing improve the locus of control and you reduce pain. So you are doing all of that with just smiling at them and getting to know them and, and really truly listening to their story. So already you've started to change how their brain works with their pelvic floor and that's really important. Then you um, put your finger on the pelvic floor now when you do that, you take that whole knowledge and experience that their brain has of you being a therapeutic person in some uh, some degree um, that's going to help them and you translate that and you work their emotional centres um, and their deeper brain levels to say what I'm doing is not threatening to you and you reinforce that, I do. I gently talk my patients through it and then I start distracting them, I start getting them to think about nice things they've done at the weekend or telling me about this or that while I'm saying, and breathe in, and breathe out, and activate your pelvic floor, and relax. And what would you, what did you get to, what's your dog called again? Just things that make them happy. If the brain is happy, it's gonna be less threatened. The minute that they start to, to blanch, or you notice any autonomic changes, so sweating, redness, um, they're distracted, their invisible distress stop, because you're reinforcing that, that threat response. So. All of that wonderful pet, um, therapeutic alliance stuff, we know that we're doing, but I don't want you to underplay it. It's really key. 
if you can get that great therapeutic alliance, you've already started to work with the hardest bit about this, which is getting the brain to stop feeling under threat. Right, so let's get on to the technical stuff. So when you are palpating a pelvic floor and it's painful, the first time that you palpate it, it really blooming hurts. Um, and a lot of the time what I'll do is I'll sit onto someone, say their left pelvic floor, and they'll say, oh, eight out of 10, that's really painful. Um, so I'll leave that left pelvic floor completely alone. I'll go to the right and I'll find somewhere that's four or five, maybe six out of 10, and I'll work with that. I'll get them to contract and get them to relax and apply a pelvic floor stretch or a little bit of pressure. And, and um, when I say gentle pressure, I do use my whole body weight at times, um, what feels like it, but certainly I've worked up to that process and you've got to work with your patient to very gently start increasing pressure through your hand, pressure through your body, um, as their, their body tolerates and it's not a tolerating kind of pressure it's a what's comfortable for them does it just feel like a stretch or does it feel like pain if it's pain you're reinforcing threat don't do it so um, the minute that you start to do that and put your finger there you are creating a desensitization because we uh, it's been interesting work by Pish um, I hope that's how you say it in 2015 uh, looking at counter irritation responses so it's something we've known for a long time if you hurt your knee your mum steps on your other foot and then it makes the pain a little bit better because your brain's got other things to think about. So applying force to one area of the pelvic floor, which is um, uh, technically painful at that moment, is creating a counter irritation that goes straight up into the brain. And we, we know about all of our descending inhibitory systems. They get activated. We get possibly a little bit of a release of opioids, possibly just a little bit of a, a change in um, signal strength is a good way of putting it, of the, the output of pain that we receive. But certainly a lot of the time I'll say, right, that left pelvic floor, we'll leave it alone, work on the right for a while, and then we go back to the left, and I'll say, what does it feel like here? And they go, yeah, it's all right. And I go, okay, well, that was eight out of 10, when that's exactly where I pressed last time, and they go, oh, wow, and then we'll work on that side. And that's why we're getting that, can the counter irritation creates that opioid release, potentially also changing how our brain is um, taking inputs from that area. We're also getting a localised desensitisation, so we're improving venous flow. Uh, that's the word, there you go. Venous flow. Um, uh, so kind of uh, taking all of our normal edemas within the body, so that kind of fluid that will have pulled because our pelvic floor was potentially in a, a kind of tightened, contracted state for a long period of time, and allowing those fluids to flow normally and, and naturally, which reduces the irritation to the localised peripheral nerves. Again, there's bits and bobs I've read about this over the last couple of years. Um, it didn't really come up a lot um, at Washington this year. It doesn't mean it's not happening, but it's something that I'll, I'm interested in, but I haven't heard a lot about recently. Um, then what you're doing, by creating a full range of motion, because I hope that you are, you are reaffirming to their motor centre and their sensory, um, their sensory motor cortex, um, that cortex is, that this is what the pelvic floor does, this is where it is, this is how it acts, and you're giving them verbal cues and information as well as physical cues with your finger about where things are and what they do. That's invaluable because you're trying to change those brainy changes. You're trying to say, where is my finger and what is it doing? Where is my pelvic floor at this moment in time? Oh, I didn't realise it was up there. Can you feel the difference? Can you feel how far it's released? Can you feel how far it went up this time when I got you to activate? Those kind of things are key. And if you're getting them to use any deep breath when you do, then you're also getting a bit of gentle vagal nerve stimulation, which will be really helpful in changing, um, again, that vis uh, visceral hypersensitivity, because we know from Mr. Chalimsky's work that we get that visceral overflow. Now, a long time, not a long time ago, about three years ago, I started doing a lit review on what do we think we're doing when we do myofascial release, and I've reclaimed that term um, for the pelvic floor how are we doing it and what technique are people using and getting specifics of techniques was quite difficult which is why I published the whole of my technique in my paper and I have since critiqued it and decided that it isn't perfect but nonetheless um, it's there for you guys to, to chat and tell me what you think about. Um, and from the papers that I gathered and I've added one to it recently and it fits the same mould, um, of the seven or eight um, reasonable quality papers that um, came through talking about pelvic floor myofascial work, changing pain, urgency, frequency of the bladder, specifically for bladder pain syndrome. We know that the ones that don't work use um, specific points. They do it for a specific period of time and they do it for a greatest period, uh, greatest tolerable pressure. So they're getting patients, they're just going here, 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 here with every patient 
uh, same points and they're pressing as hard as they can until the patient goes, ow, I can't tolerate it anymore. And some people got better, but it wasn't as good as biofeedback or other kind of down training in that study. Now the rest of them that did pretty well used um, a bit of a longer time, so that one was somewhere between five and five, ten minutes. The rest of them were doing at least 15 minutes work. They were using an individualised approach to how they did it, so they were looking at the patient presentation in front of them. They were um, applying contract, relax, PNF, pre-synaptic inhibition style um, activation sequences for the pelvic floor, which is important. We know that if you get the muscle, if you get any muscle to work before you try and relax it or release it or stretch it or make it longer, which is all we're doing, um, you want to, if you can activate it first, you get a, a greater presynaptic inhibition of further contraction, so you get a greater release. So those that said, pull in your back passage and now relax down, had a better effect while they were doing the release. So certainly you shouldn't be going in there and just pressing, you should be using that contract and that release. They looked individualised for the patient, so if one patient's obturator internus is really painful on the left, you go for it. If the other's is puberectalis on the right, then you go for that bit, whatever's painful for the patient. And you go for uh, what I call in my course is sub-threshold. So you go for sub-threshold pain and you read that patient while you're doing it, which is no one's really talked about yet, but is one of the soft skills, which I think is incredibly valuable in physio, which is that you read your patient. So by that I mean, um, uh, you're reading their, what their body's telling you. So the postures they're in, the words they use to describe things as you're beginning to assess them. The way that their body responds, does it mottle? Have we got an autonomic response in um, vascular opening the whole body, just an area? I've seen whole bodies go mottled when I've just begun to touch them and I've said, actually, we need to talk about this a bit more because you're under major threat. Um, do they go red? Do they sweat? Do they feel sick? I've had lots of people nauseous, which is uh, a thing that I'll come on to later in another vlog. But you really need to read the patient and you need to stay sub threshold. So the point at which they start to report pain, you've lost because their brain has gone back through that sequence and decided what you're doing is threatening. So again, it might be that you change your pressure. It might be that you get them chatting. So if patients are really struggling with me and we haven't talked lots because I'm tired or I don't know, so I'm not on game that day, um, I might go, OK, so what did you, you know, when, when was the last holiday that you went on that you really liked? Oh, if you go on a hundred million, what would you do with it? Something that makes them happy, something that keys into them, get to know your patients, their brain go, oh, that's a nice thought. Talk about their cats. I talk about my cats a lot. Um, whatever it is that makes them happy, get their brain in a different state and then retry and you might find that their pain changes and you're able to go a little bit harder or spend a little longer or do something else without creating that pain. Okay, so in summary, it's not about the wand. It's what you do with it that matters and and the whole process that the vagina and the pelvic floor and um, the brain most importantly go through when you are applying your fingers to someone's pelvic floor so patients um uh, watching this you definitely you need some guidance you do need some guidance because you need someone that knows the inside of the body and knows you so they can really help you with finding what your areas are to release if you need that but actually a lot of the work that you can do is on just calming your system down getting your pelvic floor to move through its range of motion which might just be through actually working the muscle and releasing it fully and making sure you can feel a full release and if you can't then maybe using your finger to help you release or using a deep squat with a breath um, but it's not it's not a process that we have to use the wound and we have to use it in a certain way trigger points don't kind of exist um, we think of them in a different way now. We know the muscle's painful. We know there's something there. We just don't call it a trigger point anymore. We look at what else it could be. And it's much more complicated and much more beautiful a process um, than I think physios re reduce it to sometimes. Okay, so we're not stretching. A little thing about stretching. Can you change sarcomere length in 20 seconds? Doubtful. Um, a lot of the time I'll go, wow, this person's pelvic floor is really long compared to last time. I don't think I've lengthened it. I don't think they've lengthened it. They might have applied a few pressure stretches in between, but I think stretching takes a longer period of time. Um, what you're getting is a neuromuscular relaxation of the tissue, which is allowing it to be in its normal length and state, and that's why we get the changes um, to pain as well. Well, and we get the brainy changes up, um, uh, upregulating as well, so that's how we get pain changes, urgency, frequency, bladder changes, lots of other stuff going on. It's not about the wand. 
I've talked lots now. Um, it's just something I'm really passionate about and I want you to really get it right. You are totally a badass if you're treating pelvic floor pain. Um, carry on. And I hope this has been useful. If you want to chat to me at any time, um, head on over to jillybond.com or at jilly underscore bond on Twitter. Um, I would welcome your thoughts.